those of you who are joining us from Asia, and good afternoon for everyone in between. Uh, my name is Ben Hopkins, and I'm the director of the Seeger Center for Asian Studies at the George Washington University and the Elliott School for International Affairs. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today to a book launch of one of my uh, fantastic colleagues, Bruce Dixon. Um, today, we're going to be talking about his newly published book, The Party and the People, which examines the uh, role and governance of the CCP in contemporary China. And we're joined uh, by a special guest for discussing his work today, our uh, newly minted Dean, uh, Dr. Alyssa Ayers. This is going to be a really exciting event today, and I'm so glad that you you're able to join us. Before we get into the event itself, I just need to uh, articulate a couple of ground rules. Um, first of all, I should let you all know that this event is being recorded and it will subsequently be available for viewing later on our YouTube channel. Secondly, uh, as we want this to be an interactive discussion of Bruce's scholarship, uh, Bruce will go ahead and present a, a brief overview of the book, and then uh, uh, Alyssa will go ahead with a discussion, but we want to make this as interactive as possible, and we count on you to do that. Um, what I mean by that is that we welcome and encourage any questions, comments, or insights you might have. Please post those to the Q&A box, which is on the right-hand side of your window. If you go ahead and put those in there, along with some identifying uh, um, comments about yourself and where you're coming from, that will be most helpful, and we will uh, integrate as many of those as possible in the amount of time we have. The other uh, thing I want to mention is at the end of all of this, uh, in keeping with the tradition we've been doing at the Seeger Center, we will, of course, be giving away a copy of Bruce's book to the uh, lucky winner. So uh, please do put your questions in, tweet out about uh, our discussion today, and you're automatically entered into the book giveaway. For those of you who are not fortunate enough to be the winner for the book giveaway, uh, we also have a discount code for, um, for Bruce's book. Uh, so we will put that in the chat box, and I really encourage all of you to go ahead and uh, get an early order on for your stocking stuffers, uh, your your e presents, and your Hanukkah presents as well, because it's definitely worth uh, the 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 look. Um, with that said, why don't I go ahead and introduce today's speakers, and then turn the floor over to them. Uh, Bruce Dixon is a professor of political science here at the George Washington University, and himself has previously been uh, director of the Seeger Center. For Asian studies. Bruce has a long pedigree and a number of works on the uh, uh, Communist Party of China and contemporary Chinese politics, um, all of which are extraordinarily uh, insightful. Bruce has his PhD in political science from the University of Michigan a while ago, uh, and now is giving PhDs to his own students these days. Um, our discussant for today's uh, uh, presentation is Dean Alyssa Ayers, who joined us here at the Elliott School this past February. Uh, before joining us at the Elliott School, Alyssa served both in government and in the think tank world. She was Deputy Assistant Secretary for South Asia in the Department of State under the Obama administration and served as a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, where she continues to have a, a, a um, an adjunct role, uh, double hatting as Dean of the Elliott School. She herself is an accomplished scholar with a number of Oxford University Press books, which focus on the history and contemporary politics of the South Asian subcontinent. I think we're it, it's an understatement indeed to say we're in for an absolutely fantastic treat, uh, both with uh, Bruce's discussion and presentation, as well as with uh, Dean Ayer's insights and questions. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Bruce. Okay, thanks, Ben, for that very enthusiastic introduction. Uh, and thanks to Dean Ayers for being here to lead the discussion uh, after my remarks. Uh, and thank all of you who have taken time out of your day to be here uh, to hear about uh, a little bit about my, uh, my new book. So let me put my slides up here. Uh, I should note that I'm uh, speaking today from my dungeon. Uh, my cable, so hopefully we'll stay connected uh, for the for the time of the talk. 
Um, this, uh, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. It was uh, a small conspiratorial group of only 50 members when it was first formed back in 1921. Uh, but now it is a ruling party of over 90 million members that has governed China since 1949. So over 70 years as the ruling party of that country. So what explains the longevity of the, the Communist Party, both as 100 years of existence, but also more importantly, more than 70 years of as a ruling party? Uh, so in the talk today, I want to emphasize three themes that are, that are prominent in the book. First, the Leninist nature of the political system. Second of all, uh, the balance between repression and responsiveness and how the party interacts with the people. Uh, and third, the changes that are taking place under Xi Jinping and how that may affect uh, both the party and its relationship with the people going forward. So the key thing to know about the Chinese political system is that it's, it's governed by a Leninist party. Um, and it used to be, there used to be lots of Leninist parties that govern countries, but now there's only a small handful uh, and China being perhaps the, the best exemplar of that. Um, but since they're not as common as they used to be, it's worth emphasizing the key features of, of what a Leninist party uh, entails. In terms of ideology, Karl Marx may have provided the ideology for communism and the goal of creating a communist utopia of uh, the abolition of private property, the gradual withering away of the state, the CCP has largely abandoned those set of goals, but the Leninist nature of the party, the principles that guide it, remain quite prominent. One key aspect of that is that it remains a vanguard party, which among other things means it's, it's hard to get into and a very small percentage of the population belongs to the party, only about 6%. Um, and uh, it's difficult to get into, so for every six or seven people who apply, only one gets accepted. Uh, the, it used to be the, the mass base for the party, the core base of support was from farm workers and soldiers, the so-called proletariat revolution, revolutionary classes. Nowadays, the main source of, of new party members are college students. So it's still a vanguard party, but now it's the urban educated elites that it's focusing on, not the so-called revolutionary classes. Um, the people who join the party nowadays join primarily for the career benefits because being a party member universities, other types of organizations um, see party membership as an important credential. Um, externally is the more um, elaborate features of a Leninist party. Uh, the party enjoys a monopoly on political organization in the country. There are no opposition parties. There are no groups with uh, uh, that pose a threat to the party uh, in that sense. Uh, when I say it enjoys a monopoly, I should say it enforces that monopoly, as I'll talk about uh, a bit later in the talk. Uh, it monitors society through a network of party cells where Party members are organized into small groups where they live, where they work, uh, and these, these cells provide the eyes and ears of the party to monitor what's taking place within society, within the workplaces, within residential areas. This combined with more modern technology of facial recognition software, um, cell phone apps, big data analysis, allows the party to monitor where people are, who they're with, what they're doing, and this combination of the more analog party cells and the more digital technology gives the party tremendous monitoring capacity over what's happening in society. Uh, another feature of a Lenin's party that the CCP still exhibits is, is government oversight. So it plays a prominent role both in the policy making and the impl implementation of policy by the government. It also appoints uh, officials to all government positions, mostly for all high level positions, party members. So this integration of the party with the government uh, gives a tremendous control over, over what the state does. And not just appointing people to government positions, but uh, in universities, hospitals, state-owned enterprises, banks, uh, virtually any position is by a party member. 
and the party is supreme across all those institutions. Um, so at the, at the central level, the general secretary of the party outranks the prime minister. At the provincial level, the party secretary outranks the governor. The municipal level secretary outranks the mayor and so on. For universities, banks, for SOEs, the president of that organization may be the public face of that organization, but it's the party secretary that really holds uh, significant power. Um, to kind of illustrate or exemplify that party supremacy, uh, back in 20, 2017, the current general secretary of the party, Xi Jinping, uh, at his opening speech to the uh, the 19th National Party Congress of that year said government, military, society, and schools, north, south, east, and west, the party leads it all. Um, and especially under Xi, that effort to lead it all um, and to prevent any real or perceived threat from emerging has been a key task of the party. Now, ex in explaining how the party leads it all and how it interacts with society, uh, most explanations begin with repression as its key tool. That the party in China is repressive is, is widely recognized. We often hear about the harsh treatment of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in Xinjiang, the ongoing crackdown on the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong, uh, the arrest and detention of dissidents within China. Um, in these variety of ways, the party uh, uh, shows that it is serious about maintaining its supremacy and addressing what it sees as, as potential threats. Given these enduring realities of the Chinese political system, the use of repression is no surprise, but what should we make of a political system that's so often repressive, not accountable to its people through elections, and yet can also be responsive to public opinion? That's the paradox in many ways of Chinese politics in the 21st century, this balance of repression, but also responsiveness, even without accountability. The CCP's willingness to be responsive is shown in a variety of ways. Um, first of all, um, it, uh, its policy process may be shrouded in secrecy, especially on politically sensitive issues, uh, but it also solicits the opinions of experts and stakeholders, regular citizens on most pending laws and regulations before they uh, actually get adopted. Um, and studies have shown that higher rates of public comments on these laws and, and uh, draft regulations, um, the more public comments there are, the less likely protests are to occur when the laws and regulations actually get adopted. Its policies of rapid economic growth have produced extensive environmental damage, uh, but it has cleaned up the air in major cities and become a global leader in renewable energy uh, after attracting both international attention and public outcry over the terrible nature of the air in China. So the, the photo here, the two photos are from the same window on a relatively clear day in Beijing and during the 2013 air apocalypse when the, when the city was just uh, encased in this dense uh, fog or a smog, cloud of smog. Um, back in, in 2006, 16 of the 20 cities in the world with the worst air, the most polluted air were in China. By 29, only four of them were, in part because so many other cities around the world it got worse and worse, we're trying to clean up a little bit. It clearly hasn't addressed all the environmental problems in the country. A uh, report came out yesterday that in 2019, uh, China was responsible for 27% of the greenhouse gases emitted that year, more than all of the OECD countries combined. But at least in the tangible sign of cleaner air, uh, it's listened to the public and, and done something about it. Um, it engages in corrupt land grabs in order to turn agricultural land and urban housing areas into industrial and commercial projects. Uh, but it also abandons plans when they run up against uh, not in my backyard or NIMBY protests. Uh, so on the, on the left-hand side, the photo there uh, 
is a protest against the building of a PX plant. PX is this very flammable chemical that is used in plastics and polyester fabrics. Uh, it's to toxic when it's inhaled or uh, uh, rubbed onto the skin. Uh, and so in a number of cities, plans to build a PX plant, plant got stopped because of these NIMBY protests. Um, there's a famous incident in Shanghai where they're planning on building a new high-speed rail, a maglev train from, from Shanghai out to the new Pudong airport. Uh, but because of the NIMBY disputes of this train running through residential areas, uh, that plan eventually got, got, uh, got dropped. Uh, the party often will punish and arrest the leaders of protests, but at the same time, pay compensation to people who have been uh, harmed in some way, either through loss of job, loss of housing, or in other ways, uh, provide compensation for some of these, uh, what are seen as being appropriate or legitimate demands. Uh, the party's approach to civil society is one way of really illustrating this, this interaction between repression and responsiveness. Um, the, uh, the party is wary of civil society uh, as being a potential threat to, to, uh, to its hold on power. Many observers of China would say that it doesn't have a civil society. And if you define civil society as groups that have uh, sort of a pro-democracy orientation that try and, and push public reform or regime change, then by that definition, China doesn't really have much of a civil society. And the groups that try to do those things are actively repressed, suppressed by, by the party. But it also has a huge number of other organizations involved in things like environmental awareness, job training programs, cultural activities uh, that are also uh, uh, exist and sometimes uh, get supported by, by local governments in different ways that I'll, I'll mention in just a bit. There are roughly 800,000 registered NGOs in China and estimates are twice that many unregistered but still active NGOs in the country. They exist in this sort of legal gray area, not fully registered, but not uh, targeted by the party as, as a threat, uh, not engaged in political activities. Um, and, and showing how the party is, has dealt with this evolving sector kind of illustrates its, its adaptiveness to changes that happen within, within the country. So during the 1990s, uh, when Jiang Zemin was general secretary, the party's main goal was to constrain civil society. This was soon after the 1989 demonstrations in Tiananmen Square and elsewhere in the country that almost brought down the party. Also after uh, communist governments in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe collapsed, and especially in Eastern Europe, civil society groups were seen as an important force in bringing down those, those governments. Um, so even though Jiang Zemin and the party at that time was actively promoting rapid economic growth, the expansion of the private sector, uh, it was also wary of letting civil society grow in the country and made it difficult for groups to form, to, to, to uh, be registered, uh, and in general to be active. In the 2000s, when Hu Jintao was general secretary, the party's priorities shifted to not just promoting rapid economic growth, but also to try and find some way of distributing the benefits of economic growth more widely, a greater concern with equity, not just with growth. Uh, and as one way of doing that was to find ways of supporting and cooperating with local NGOs in the country. Um, there were uh, often contracts given, government contracts given to local NGOs, environmental groups to promote recycling initiatives or uh, litter uh, initiatives, uh, labor organizations that could provide job training and life skills training to people uh, that could provide some measure of, of health care, that could provide cultural activities and entertainment for, especially for migrant workers. These contracts also had a, a double edge by accepting the contracts. The NGOs who were very desperate to get that kind of funding uh, also had to limit their activities because those contracts could be canceled, they could not be renewed. Uh, so instead of engaging in 
say, collective bargaining for labor organizations or pushing for policy change for environmental groups, uh, they had to do things that were in line with current policy uh, in order to, to get and maintain the support and cooperation of, of local officials. Once Xi Jinping becomes General Secretary um, in 2012, the focus of the party once again becomes not just constraining, but further cracking down on civil society groups. She wants all activities to funnel through formal institutions that the party can control uh, and is less tolerant of the informal arrangements that allowed so many civil society groups to flourish in the past. In addition to um, uh, cracking down on the unregistered gray area NGOs, the party is also now using one of its traditional practices of building party cells within these non-governmental organizations. Uh, during the first five years that she was general secretary, the number of, of NGOs with party cells within them grew by almost two thirds from about 35% to over 60%, showing the party's efforts to try and monitor more carefully what those organizations were doing. Uh, just in the last few weeks, there's been a new initiative to further crack down on on NGOs in the country, uh, targeting especially the unregistered ones, but even the registered ones are now uh, facing closure. Now, this puts local officials in a bind because they have come to rely so much on NGOs to provide important social welfare benefits to their communities. So they have this bind between the one hand needing to show loyalty for Xi's new policy, but at the same time, um, not wanting to surrender the benefits that came with that cooperation. Um, so th there may be like slow walking of this of implementation of this policy or perhaps cracking down on a few while quietly continuing to support uh, and work with other ones. Um, now, what would, why would the party be willing to be responsive to public opinion, given the fact that it is not uh, accountable to them through elections or, or other formal means. Um, and there's three reasons for this, all having to do with the party's strategy for survival. First of all, maintaining stability is a key goal of the party and a key priority for local officials. Uh, in order to get promoted or even just to keep their job, uh, officials have to make sure that protests or large strikes don't break out on their watch. So they often take uh, budgetary funds that have been earmarked for police and public security forces, the repressive arm of the state, and use those funds to pay settlements to uh, workers who've been fired without severance pay or their, their, their workplaces have been closed without providing uh, severance pay uh, for people whose homes have been destroyed without adequate compensation, different monetary uh, demands that the party is willing, that local officials are willing to meet so they don't have to use uh, repressive uh, tactics. Second of all, the party wants to avoid a nationwide protest movement. There are similar grievances throughout the country and the party doesn't want to make, doesn't want to allow protest in one area to snowball to other areas the way the 1989 demonstrations did. Uh, and thirdly, the party wants to preempt demands for democracy in the country, it wants to pre preempt any challenge to its hold on power and its status as China's ruling party. Um, the, the images on the, on the right here re refer to a movement back in 2008, an online petition that was designed to encourage or call for more ambitious political reforms, more pro-democratic reforms in the country one of the key drafters of that online document, uh, Liu Xiaobo on the bottom, uh, was arrested soon after um, the, uh, the petition was posted online, uh, later uh, uh, sentenced uh, uh, in prison while soon after he was um, convicted in prison, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2010. Um, he uh, died in 20, 2017, soon after being released from prison on medical parole. Um, um, so uh, there hasn't really been a key figure leading a, 
a pro-democracy movement in China because of the party's um, uh, desire to preempt all those types of demands. Um, so the variety of reasons why the party is willing to be responsive to public opinion. Uh, but get to my third topic, uh, under Xi Jinping, there's been a turn towards uh, more repressive tactics uh, and being less willing to be responsive to public opinion. And these are seen in three ways. One, the party now criminalizes protests. They're not just seen as a uh, threat to stability, but now they're seen as, as more outright crimes. Um, uh, back in 2015, uh, in one fell swoop, uh, over 300 of, of China's uh, lawyers that are involved in defending the rights of, of workers, of religious practitioners, of other individuals, rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution, but are often not honored in, in, in practice. Uh, the lawyers, their staff were uh, arrested uh, all at once. Many of them were later released, uh, but some were convicted of sub subverting state power um, and sent to prison. Uh, second key change that the party now relies more on preemptive repression not waiting for protests to happen and then crack down on them, but started in the first place. Um, in 2019, there's an effort to create a, a Me Too movement in China uh, that was immediately repressed before it could really get underway. There were a couple of accusations against um, media, um, celebrities and uh, scholars, but it was quickly uh, shut down before it could pick up steam largely by censoring discussion of the Me Too movement online in China. Uh, there's also a group called the Feminist Five that was wanted to publicize sexual harassment in the country. They were arrested and charged with illegal assembly, even though they hadn't been able to organize a protest yet, but they had been trying to do it and that in itself was reason to, uh, to arrest them. They had violated two key rules of of everyday politics in China. First of all, social movements that are that are bottom up without the party's approval and without the party's um, uh, active involvement are seen as a threat to the party's monopoly on power. And second of all, they were trying to create similar protests in different cities simultaneously. And those kind of horizontal links of, of uh, engaging in protest are also seen as a major threat to the party's power and quickly uh, uh, quickly suppressed. And third, um, protests are now in criticism, uh, online criticism are framed as national security threats, uh, not just um, uh, sort of domestic issues. Uh, soon after Xi Jinping became general secretary, uh, in 2013, the party released uh, or issued a, a secret document that became known as document number nine, which identified seven so-called malicious Western values, including constitutional democracy and civil society that could not be taught in schools and could not be discussed in the media. Um, international NGOs that used to be able to operate without being registered now have to register. Uh, and unlike domestic NGOs that register with the Ministry of Civil Affairs, international NGOs have to try and get registered by the Public Security Bureau. So they're automatically under the eye of the repressive arm of the state. In the past, these kinds of ideas and activities were characterized as threats to, to stability, but under Xi Jinping, they're now uh, framed as threats to national security in part by linking the people and groups involved to, um, to foreign influences. And at a time when the party is usually nationalism as a key part of its legitimizing uh, practices, uh, castigating your critics as unpatriotic, as under the influence of foreign governments, uh, means that it's very difficult for them to generate any amount of, of public support. Um, so to wrap up here, just hit a couple of uh, these, these key points that, that uh, characterize the book. Uh, first of all, the party has remained China's ruling party for over 70 years, in large part because it was built on Leninist 
principles and continues to abide by them. There's no question that the party uses repression in its, uh, in its approach to perceived enemies and even more so under Xi Jinping, uh, but also other use, uses other tools to get popular support, rising living standards, nationalist pride, uh, responsiveness to public opinion in, in varying degrees. For people whose, whose image of China was, was shaped by the Cultural Revolution or the 1989 demonstrations, more recently by uh, critiques by political leaders and reports in the media, describing the party as both repressive and responsive may seem jarring. Um, so it's my hope that readers of the book will come away with a fuller understanding of China's political system, how it has got to this point, and where it may be going uh, in the future. Uh, and with that, I look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you so much, uh, Bruce. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Alyssa Ayers, and I'm, uh, as Ben referenced, the new dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs here at the George Washington University. Um, for me, it's a real privilege to be able to join you to launch uh, Professor Dixon's book, The Party and the People, today. I think understanding the Chinese Communist Party and its history and the recent trends could not be more important nor more urgent in our world today. And Bruce's new book provides an overview that is really approachable for non-specialists. Uh, I think you all have just heard uh, from his presentation, he's, he's spent decades studying Chinese domestic politics, regimes and regime change and, and comparative politics more generally. And he draws upon that entire well of his expertise in the party and the people. Um, Bruce, I, I, I wanna follow up with just a couple questions before we open up to some of the questions that are coming in from our other participants, if you don't mind. Um, and, and one of the questions I really would love to hear a little bit more about, because you, you do cover this in, in your book, and it actually draws on some of your own survey research. I was honestly surprised to learn in your book uh, that China's newest generation is not more nationalist than its predecessors. Um, I, as a person who reads the news, I had a, the opposite impression, actually. Um, but your own survey work shows how this post-90 generation is, is slightly less nationalist than the previous generations. It's actually very counterintuitive. So can you give us a little bit more detail about all of this in your own research that um, uh, from which you drew this, drew this finding? Uh, sure, that is one of the more, I think, surprising uh, uh, statements for, for people who, who don't uh, follow the details quite as carefully. and. Um, there's no question that China is extremely nationalistic, perhaps the most nationalistic country in the world based upon international surveys of different types. Uh, but uh, not just my own surveys, but those done by other people um, within China have shown consistently that the younger generation uh, is less nationalistic in, in their attitudes than their, than their elders are. So, how could you that be that consistent finding? And yet we have this perception that that the younger people are the most nationalistic. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that young people tend to engage in protest more than than their elders do. Uh, they're more idealistic. Perhaps they have have less to lose, and so they're more willing to speak out. Second of all, uh, the party tolerates nationalist protests in ways it doesn't tolerate other kinds of protests. Um, and so uh, nationalist protests also become a vehicle for raising other kinds of demands, uh, especially critiques of corruption within the party and the government. Um, and thirdly, much of the perception of the younger generation being so nationalistic is really born out of what people read on social media. Uh, and just as we know in this country, social media isn't really indicative of public opinion more generally it tends to highlight the more extreme voices. And within China, people have more moderate or uh, less nationalistic views are easily shouted down on social media as, as being unpatriotic. Uh, and so it's, it's just the most virulent voices that get heard. Um, and that's what gets our attention. 
I, I would urge everyone to take a look at uh, this section of Bruce's book because it is really fascinating. Um, let me follow up with one additional question. Uh, the, the very last chapter of your book gets, I think, to the big question that, that people around the world are asking, will China become democratic, right? This isn't a new question. It's a question that has been uh, at the heart of different U.S. foreign policy decisions. Um, the decision to support Chinese membership in the WTO decades ago. Um, you walk through this question, present the reasons that people had thought there may be a pathway to uh, a democratic China. You also present reasons for skepticism um, and you talk about the sobering context. Can you can you go into this a little bit more for our, our participants today? Uh, sure, I'd, I'd be happy to because you know, ironically, when I first sent in this proposal and the reviewers looked at it, they discouraged writing a chapter about the prospects for democracy because it, it, they there's there's nothing to talk about from their perspective, among other China specialists. But in my experience as a teacher, as a public speaker, this is the question that people want to know about. Um, and there's expectation that that China would democratize. On the one hand, people who, if you're familiar with modernization theory, the idea that as countries develop and modernize, pressures for uh, democracy will, will grow. There's a definite correspondence between wealthy countries and democracies. Um, and so the thought was, as China was, was modernizing, urbanizing, uh, the level of literacy and education was growing, all these things would lead to greater uh, demands for democracy in the country. Um, on the other hand, the party's also been delivering a lot of economic growth and people see rising living standards uh, and their performance legitimacy creates a tremendous amount of support for the status quo. Uh, there's also thought there's this natural affinity between capitalist economies and democratic political systems. So as you have more and more economic reform, you would eventually have to have political reform to keep the two systems in balance um that just didn't pan out in in china and in some ways ref economic reform has been rolled back a bit so that disconnect is not as prominent as it, as it may have seen in a more general sense though in terms of popular perceptions within the country another surprising finding is that most people in china think the country is already getting more and more democratic uh, but they don't define democracy in terms of elections and rule of law and civil rights and political liberties. They see it in terms of policies that benefit society, that improve public welfare. And for the vast majority of people in China, economic reforms have led to higher standards of living. Uh, and so uh, they see that as being um, a, a, a type of democracy that we would not see it that way, but that's how it's perceived within China, and they see more and more of it happening. Um, foreign models of democracy don't have the appeal they once had. Uh, so when, when especially Chinese look at what's taken place in the United States in recent years, especially the poor response of to COVID and to the, the uh, January 6th um, attack on the Capitol, they look at that and, and just say, democracy can't handle those problems, why would we want to try something like that? Um, and the last point is not so much about China, but it is about process of democratization more generally. In most cases, regime change does not lead to a new democracy. It leads to a new authoritarian regime that takes its place. Uh, so just promoting regime change is no guarantee of democratization. Uh, we've seen in, in Egypt, uh, in the, at the Arab Spring, uh, much of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union countries have, have adopted authoritarian regimes. So the promise or the hope that the end of authoritarian rule will lead to democracy uh, just, doesn't, just doesn't bear out in the examples of other countries. And, and that is what you refer to as the sobering context here. Beyond all the other sobering uh, things to keep in mind. That is very sobering. Um, Bruce, we have a lot of questions coming in. Let me turn to some of these. We've got a two-part question from uh, one of our Fulbright postdoctoral scholars, Zarina Burkadze. Um, the question is, I'm wondering about the author's opinion on Chinese foreign policy strategies. 
Can we say that China promotes autocracy abroad? And if yes, why and how? Another question pertains to the strength of the regime in China and its capacity. How does China differ from other authoritarian superpowers in using repressive mechanisms against opponents of the regime? So that's a two-parter. Um, I'll answer the first question quickly because the book doesn't really address its foreign policy strategy. Um, it, it doesn't seem as active or as, or as eager to promote either its political model or its economic model. It is, it is actively promoting uh, through its Belt and Road Initiative, uh, new projects throughout Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, and, and now a little more quietly uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean to try and increase its influence in a variety of ways. Um, many of those uh, programs don't have uh, conditions attached to them. And so there's no, there's no conditionality for greater transparency lack of corruption. So these, these uh, programs perhaps uh, support or reinforce autocratic rule in those countries, but uh, that's almost a, a side effect of the, the larger uh, goal of, of China uh, expanding its, its economic and diplomatic influence. Um, on the, in the way that it represses, it handles its critics and its opponents within the, within the country, um, it is uh, typical of a Leninist one-party regime to handle threats the way that it does. Uh, more and more you know, other countries have been using digital technologies to be able to monitor society, uh, censorship over the internet. Um, um, so it hasn't necessarily been particularly innovative in these areas. There's nothing terribly distinctive about how China handles it. Um, um, probably what's more uh, atypical perhaps or more distinctive for China is that it, it doesn't simply repress demands. Uh, it certainly does that, uh, but also more quietly in ways that don't often get uh, the attention of, of uh, the popular media, also find ways of uh, quietly addressing some of the demands uh, without simply sending in the, the troops to, to suppress the, the protests. Thank you. Um, we have now got a question here um, from Joyce Medancy. Is there a distinction between the party's response to civil society and protests in the cities and those that originate in the countryside? Uh, Joyce, great to hear from you. Joyce and I have met in grad school and uh, uh, we've kind of lost touch except by email over the years. Um, there's differences in the type of protests that occur in the countryside and what occur in the cities. Uh, in, the, in the countryside, most of the protests in recent years have been about what we refer to as land grabs, where local officials take existing farmland to create industrial parks or commercial ventures uh, and pay the farmers a pittance for what they've lost both for their housing for their the lost value of their of their future value of their fields so much of the protests that occur in the countryside are really focused on that uh, in the cities it's a wider range of of protests um, it's often about also land grabs of older residential areas that are torn down in new high rises or commercial parks are built. Uh, but uh, in urban areas is also concern about uh, transportation, about pollution, about other things. So there's a wider range of protests that occur there. Um, the city or the, the party responds uh, to both in similar ways um, of wanting to bring them to a, a close as quickly as possible. Um, and to the extent that it does try and address the, the immediate concerns, underlying concerns of the protesters, wants to do so in ways that it doesn't create a uh, example that other protesters may follow in other areas, because the same complaints occur throughout China, uh, and they wanna make sure that they don't snowball to have a, a larger impact around the country. Great, thank you. Here we have a question from a student from Shanghai. Uh, this question is, 
My personal feeling is that most of my friends do not believe in communism. Do you think that it will shake the CCP's rule in the future? Um, you know, for quite a while, most people who have joined the party say they do so not because they believe in communism, they do so for their career benefits. Um, that presents a problem in the long run, because if you're simply joining it because you see the material benefits of it, uh, you may not be a very strong supporter of it. Uh, under Xi Jinping, there's an effort now to create uh, more political study and different Different way, uh, values and ideas of the party, but they're running up against people's lived experience that that what the party is trying to promote isn't really as a sense of them anymore. Um, so, on the one hand, as I said at the outset, the party has given up the goals of creating a communist utopia. Even the leaders don't really believe that's going to happen. Uh, so, they look for other ways of creating popular support, both through rising living standards. Uh, nationalist pride, um, uh, more tangible, more, more material ways of, of getting popular support for the party's continued rule. Um, those things are more fragile, however. So a severe economic downturn uh, is a threat to uh, many authoritarian regimes. Um, nationalist pride can be uh, fragile because if China were to engage in a international conflict or was seen as being not sufficiently vigilant against a foreign pressure, that can also undermine support for the party. Um, so the party itself doesn't rely very much on communist ideology to get support for it anymore. Uh, it's much more in kind of what we refer to as performance legitimacy, other ways of showing the tangible benefits of, of having the party in place. Uh, whether they'll be able to sustain that in the long run, especially as younger generations uh, replace their elders, is going to be a real test. Um, many people have been predicting the downfall of the party really since the beginning of the reform era back in the late 70s, early 80s. But the party's adapted in different ways. As society has changed, the party has adapted as well. What's, what's uh, notable about the Xi Jinping era is the party has kind of moved away from its willingness to adapt to society, instead trying to reimpose its authority uh, in ways that may backfire, because they they're often are targeting people who pose no threat whatsoever to the party, uh, but, are, but are wrapped up in, are, are affected by censorship and other more repressive tactics that may turn people against the party, even if they find their living standards are, are still improving. Here's a question from Joe Spear that may also dovetail um, with uh, your, your ending point then. Can you talk a bit about anti-corruption activities and how they have been used for various ends? Uh, one of the, the signature aspects of the Xi Jinping era has been the target at corruption. Um, it is one of the most unpopular aspects of the political system. The one thing that really undermines support for the party is this perception of, of wide scale corruption, um, certainly at the local level, but, but now as a part of his campaign, has revealed how much corruption there is at the very top of the political system as well. So on the one hand, it proved to be a popular campaign because he was doing something about cleaning up, uh, draining the swamp as we would re refer to it here in Washington, but cleaning up corruption within China at the very top of the political system, the party, the government, the military, uh, as well as local officials. The challenge, the, so on the one hand, you're, you're, you're cleaning up corruption, but you're also using it to eliminate your opponents. Um, and there's, there's a political aspect to it as well of getting rid of people that Xi, Xi Jinping saw as potential threats to his individual power. One of the real challenges of this uh, campaign, however, was the more you expose corruption uh, in order to address it, the more people realize how extensive it is. Uh, so in a, in a separate study I've, I've done with a colleague, uh, we find that the more cases of corruption there are exposed, the more officials who are charged with corruption within a province 
popular support for the party actually drops in those places. So the, the more cases of corruption, you might think it's a good thing, you're dealing with it, dealing with the popular problem, but you're also revealing how extensive it is. So uh, in some ways in the long run, this anti-corruption campaign may have reduced support for the party when the goal was to try and alleviate or address <coughs> one of the key concerns of the public, <coughs> excuse me, so it, it's in the, um, he's done it for both popular and political reasons, probably successful on the, on the political side, uh, but in terms of popular perceptions of the party, uh, it's now been revealed how much more extensive it is, even at the very top of the system. Thank you. Here we have a follow-up question on your look at repression and responsiveness. This is from Ed McCord. Uh, he asks, uh, the blurb for this discussion mentioned the surprising responsiveness of the party paired with repression, but from the talk, this level of responsiveness seems weak, seems very weak. Avoiding actions that might lead to social instability seems the most minimal responsiveness possible. Do you see any hope for reversing trends to increasing repression? I think, I think that the balance between repression and responsiveness <clears throat> was more balanced in the past. Um, after Xi Jinping became general secretary, it really became uh, less responsive and more repressive. Um, so as long as that priority remains in place, uh, the amount of responsiveness, which is really much more an informal um, response of local officials to problems in their communities um, or involvement in the policy process of, of encouraging and allowing people to make comments on pending laws and regulations and then revising uh, the draft bills uh, in light of that, that opinion. Uh, those are proven to be um, an ongoing um, set of reforms that, that uh, happens both at the local level as well as the national level. Um, uh, but under the current leadership, uh, there's definitely been a shift toward uh, relying more and more on repression. Um, it doesn't have to be that way because in the, in, in the very recent past, uh, the party has been much more tolerant of being responsive to public opinion. Uh, but under the current leadership, um, the party wants to lead it all in the way that Xi Jinping described it um, and does not tolerate criticism or even lack of expressed loyalty. Um, and so that that creates a very different dynamic than what had been the case in the not not too distant past. So here's a, a follow-up question on the, the binary of repression and responsiveness. This is from Professor Joel, Joel Kuypers. Um, I'm intrigued by the binary you present between repression and responsiveness. You give an example of arresting people who protest but then pay compensation to those who are harmed by this object of protest. What role do courts play in these compensation claims and are courts a part of the party's responsiveness? Uh, the, the courts play sort of a dual role. On the one hand, for, for actual political cases, uh, you know, when, when people are arrested for being involved as leading a protest, uh, they're almost, 100% convicted. Once you're actually uh, arrested and charged with a crime, the uh, the conviction rate is extraordinarily high. And those are often political decisions that that are given to judges, not that the judges are making by themselves. At the same time, um, if let's, let's say the protest was was a large scale labor strike, uh, the leaders of the strike may be arrested, but other workers can use the courts to address the, the uh, demands that they were making in terms of, of uh, workplace safety, unpaid wages and other things. Uh, so in, in some cases, uh, especially for these kinds of more material protests, um, repression responsiveness are used together, uh, making it more possible for people to get um, uh, satisfaction for their material demands, even through the court process, while the leaders of the protest that began the, the whole thing themselves get uh, punished for their leadership as a, it's, it's sort of a, this bizarre dynamic that on the one hand, 
you want to, local leaders are willing to address the legitimate demands of protesters, but they punish the leaders of the protests because they have disturbed the peace. Um, so it's this, this is dualism that um, uh, plays out in, in a lot of these protest cases uh, because there's a recognition that you can't simply arrest a handful of leaders because the underlying issue is still there and will fester and will we'll burst out again. So willingness to try and meet the material demands of protesters while taking the leaders who may have more of a political focus to them, uh, punishing them so they, they don't, uh, as a warning to other people in the future. So we are down to just a couple minutes left. I'm gonna try to squeeze in one question that I think would be a good way for us to wrap up. This is a question from Mel Cousins. Following on from your discussion, how will the CCP adjust to a situation where it can no longer rely mainly on high economic growth? What tools can it use to maintain power? Uh, that, that's, that's a crucial question for the party going forward. For the last, <coughs> well, since the international financial crisis, uh, or around 2008 or so, uh, China's experienced declining growth. Uh, it's still rapid growth compared to what we experienced in the United States or other countries, but relatively low compared to what uh, people experienced uh, just 10, 15 years ago. So it's trying to have a slow, gradual decline without undermining um, living standards. Uh, so you have slower growth, uh, but not necessarily uh, a reduction in, in wages or incomes of, or, or living standards. Uh, that is a very delicate process. Um, they have tried to shift their economic focus away from infrastructure spending, uh, that is a short-term stimulus um, that also creates huge amounts of debt, to try to uh, move away from reliance upon foreign trade because foreign markets are not as reliable as they used to be, um, and instead try to create more focus on domestic consumption, consumer goods, uh, and try and actually lead to being a more innovative economy and not simply one that takes existing technologies and products and makes them work better. Um, that's gonna be a huge challenge going forward because the political system, the education system is not designed to promote or reward innovation, uh, but now they're trying to create it in the economic sphere. Um, that's gonna be a, a huge challenge going forward. Um, so I think they, they're, they're they realize that so much of their popular support is based upon living standards and incomes. Um, and they're determined to, to keep that, but recognizing they have to change the, the economic models that led to the rapid growth in the past. Thank you, Bruce. I hope this just taste of the book uh, encourages people to run out and order it. That is, the Party and the People, Chinese Politics in the 21st Century. I'm so happy to have been able to, to uh, be part of moderating this discussion, and I will turn things back over to Ben. Thank you so much, Alyssa, and thank you, Bruce, for a fantastic presentation, which itself is based on an outstanding piece of scholarship. Um, I'm just going to echo what Alyssa just said and encourage everybody to go out and buy this book. We have a discount code, which is good at Princeton University Press website, which I'm now putting in the chat, and I will also say it, it's BRDI. And during the presentation, I snuck onto the website and ordered my own copy. So I encourage everybody to do it now before it sells out because you know this print run is just going to be sold out in a matter of minutes once we get off of this. Um, so uh, uh, just a couple of follow ups. A reminder that as part of our ongoing uh, book series, um, we are going to uh, have a giveaway of Bruce's book, uh, um, which will be chosen at random. Most people who participated in today's event will reach out to you. As well, this uh, talk will be on our YouTube channel um, in approximately a week or so, so do keep your eyes out for that. And a final pitch, um, the Seeger Center is having our next installment of our new books in Asian studies on uh, Tuesday, May 18th. Jagjit Lali will be talking about his new book, um, India and the Silk Roads, 
It's a fantastic piece of scholarship, which actually goes back to the 18th and 19th century. So kind of changing from our presentist uh, focus, uh, looking a little bit more at the past. Um, again, that that is on May 18th. Um, but thank you so much for everyone joining us from wherever you are today. Thank you, Bruce, for your scholarship, and we look forward to the next installment. Thank you, Alyssa, for taking the time to um, moderate this discussion and, and really bring out the, the best, best of Bruce's work. Um, and we hope to see you all again soon in the future. In the meantime, stay well.